This is part of the last set of slides for Bio 5, so congratulations on getting through the semester. Um, we're going to be covering human populations, so thinking about human biology within the context of our relationships with ecosystems. Um, so this is the second part of two of these types of uh, lectures. Um, so we're in this lecture, focusing just on chapter 45, which is population and community ecology. Um, this talks about some technical terms in, in terms of demography, so the study of human populations that didn't quite fit nicely with the other lecture, so I had it separate. So we'll cover um, sections one through six of chapter 45. Uh, so you'll need to be able to define demography, population size and population density, interpret a life table or survivorship curve, um, probably more so survivorship curve than life table. And that might be something that you need to be able to do on the written questions on the final exam. You should know the definition of life history, energy, budget, and fecundity, and relate these terms to the mechanism of natural selection, which we talked about in the previous week's lecture. Um, you also need to be able to define carrying capacity, and more importantly than that, identify the carrying capacity of an environment and population on a plot of logistic growth. Um, so looking at a graph, you'll need to be able to analyze it and identify the carrying capacity, and also understand the role of intraspecific competition, so competition within a species, in determining logistic growth. You also need to be able to track human population growth over time, compare different age structures, um, so identify types of growth using those age structures, and consider long-term consequences of different reproductive strategies. We're also, we're also going to look at a case study of coyotes and think about interspecific competition, so competition between species. And then finally, define the competitive exclusion principle related to natural selection and identify different types of symbioses. So starting with demography, remember that when we're thinking about whole ecosystems, we're thinking about both biotic and abiotic factors. And if we're looking at a population of organisms within a species and thinking about how they change, a lot of that relates to the availability of biotic and abiotic resources. So kind of thinking about the dynamic nature of populations within ecosystems. So when we're thinking about this study, we're considering population size, which is the total number of individuals, but even more importantly than that, we're thinking about population density, which is how many individuals we have per unit area or per unit volume. So how dense are these individuals? How closely packed together are they? Um, and there's some trends we can start to see just in terms of the type of individuals or type of organisms. So this plot in the upper right uh, tracks on the x-axis the logarithmic size of organisms. So that kind of makes the data fit a little bit more nicely. But in general, the farther you get on the x-axis, the bigger the organism is. And uh, the higher up you get on the y-axis, the more packed together it is. Um, and so in general, we can kind of see that um, as organism size increases, density decreases. Um, so there's kind of a relationship there. Um, that kind of is influenced by the type of food that organisms eat. Um, oftentimes herbivores are a little bit more packed together and dense than carnivores. It takes a lot of energy to sustain carnivore bodies and so they tend to be higher up um, in trophic levels um, and so there's less of them that the environment is able to support. In terms of population density, we're not just thinking about a uniform distribution. We might also be thinking about how populations are um, packed together kind of differently within a set area. So that distribution might be uniform, like with penguins. It might be random, like with dandelions, because they rely on wind um, distribution. So when you uh, blow on a dandelion clock and the seeds distribute, um, you're helping this random distribution of individuals or organisms can be clumped together like with elephants, how they move in these units, um, and so they get clumped together. I mentioned age, age structures, not egg structure, structures. Um, these are really important plots for demography, and they're a way that we can visualize the proportion of population members at specific age ranges. So when we look at this 
plot. Um, the left side is showing male individuals, the right side is showing females, and that center line basically represents zero. Then moving outward, um, you go from 0% to 10% of the overall population. So you're never going to reach 100% on that x-axis because the population is so spread out over so many different age ranges. Um, so here it's distributed into increments of five years. So that first little block is uh, zero to four, then five to nine, then 10 to 14. Um, so nice little increments, um, I guess technically of four, well, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, five year age ranges. Um, and so for this one, this is showing Japan. And so it's really heavily weighted um, kind of post-menopausally. So it's like in the uh, 40s up until the 70s, that's where the main bulk of the population is. Um, there's some individuals that are very long lived that are living in up almost to 100 years old, um, but it tends to get smaller towards the bottom, which means that there's less individuals being born. Um, and so the population is more heavily weighted towards older generations. And we can contrast this with somewhere like India, where there's not as much longevity um, and there's not as many people in those higher age ranges, but a large portion of the population is very young and that reflects very high birth rate. So another way that we can look at data and study demography is with the survivorship curve. Um, so this plots the number of individuals surviving at each age interval versus time. So on the x-axis, we have the percentage of, of maximum life expectancy, so ranging from 0 to 100. Um, so that standardizes it across all types of organisms. Um, that's important because, for example, humans often live to be in their 70s all the way up to their early hundreds. Birds may live anywhere from two to 30, even up to much higher years, um, but they routinely live to be 30 years old. And trees can live to be several hundred or even a thousand years old. Um, so we have to compare them. So we standardize them by percentage of maximum life expectancy, which ranges all of these from zero to 100. Um, so the 50 point of this might be for the bird about 15 years, it might be for the human about 35 years. Um, so when we look at these, we see type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 1 means that death is most likely to occur in very old age. So up until pretty old age, you have a lot of individuals surviving. This means that oftentimes parents put a lot of energy into uh, having and raising their offspring um, to kind of maintain that high life expectancy. Birds are type 2, which means that they're kind of equally likely to die at any point in their lifetime. And trees are type three, which means that they over reproduce, they have a ton of offspring, and then a lot of them die. I mean, think about how many seeds get eaten by birds or squirrels and packed away or never really live their life. Um, so these trees reproduce in very high numbers, but then only some of them survive um, and germinate and grow. A life table is a little bit more challenging to interpret. Um, that's why it's much nicer to uh, visualize data as plots than it is to share it as tables. These are kind of just raw information, but they do provide really important information about the life history of an organism. So if we know how to work with this data and study it, we can start to learn about the life history, which is the pattern of allocation of resources um, to going towards maintenance, so keeping your body alive, growing, so getting bigger, having more complex cells, and also reproduction at different points in life. And so uh, the amount of energy that you're putting towards different um, goals at different points in your life kind of varies. So that's talking about life history, that pattern. We can also determine mortality rate from this data, which is the probability of individuals dying before their next birthday. So kind of expanding on this idea of life history and tying it into natural selection, um, that energy budget means that there's trade-offs. You have to balance energy intake with using that energy for basic metabolism, so cellular reactions happening in your body, reproduction, parental care. I mean, think about how much time and money and energy it costs to be a parent. 
um, and then also energy storage. And there is a limited amount of energy, so we have to have trade-offs. Um, and so oftentimes we see kind of trade-offs between survivorship and fecundity. Um, so that's a common theme in natural selection. So the ones that survive are often the ones that reproduce. And when we're thinking about that term fecundity, like I just mentioned, it has to do with reproduction. So it's the potential reproductive capacity of an individual within a population, or in other words, how many offspring can this individual have? So fecundity refers to reproductive potential. So when we're thinking again about natural selection, we have to consider the role of the environment. Um, and so when we're looking at this plot where it has three different axes, it's looking at fecundity, age of maturity, and also how likely is it that a juvenile, a young individual from this population will actually survive. And when you have a very unstable environment that is constantly changing, that is having you know, a lot of serious disturbances, it really benefits the population to reproduce very quickly and just recognize that a lot of juveniles are not going to survive um, and also to reproduce much earlier in life. So you kind of get a pattern emerging that way. If the environment is a lot more stable, then you can have a higher age of maturity and have relatively lower fecundity because individuals are more likely to survive and reproduce. Um, so looking at life history includes juvenile survivorship, age of maturity, and fecundity, and recognizing that a limited energy expenditure means that you have to budget the energy that goes towards those three factors. Um, life history is in general genetically determined and shaped by the environment, so whether it's seasonal, unstable, or stable, as well as natural selection. So when we're thinking about a population actually growing and adding individuals, it could be exponential, which is in general unrealistic and doesn't last for long, or it could be logistic, which is realistic. And logistic growth reflects a carrying capacity. So it reflects this kind of upper limit that the environment can sustain, um, and it's determined by resources like food availability, mate availability, and space. And if you look at the logistic growth curve, you can see that there is a portion to it that is exponential. It just, you know, eventually slows down and plateaus. And realistically, it doesn't actually plateau. What ends up happening is it kind of overshoots this carrying capacity, and then a bunch of individuals die, and then they kind of go back up, and it just kind of rebounds around that carrying capacity. So when you're looking at a plot of logistic growth, you should be able to kind of identify where it plateaus and determines, determine the carrying capacity. Um, so oh, before we go into that, um, this idea of survivorship within a population and meeting carrying capacity, um, you know, there's still kind of uh, similar dynamics happening, but obviously some individuals are dying. So there's something that's stopping everyone from surviving. And a lot of that comes down to intraspecific competition for those food and mates and space. So it's competition between members of the same species that kind of limits the size of the population and determines carrying capacity. So when we're looking at these two uh, populations, kind of hypothetical populations, the one on the left is yeast. Um, and so something that's interesting about this is uh, these are obviously reflecting very different population sizes and kind of population areas. So in general, yeast are very tiny and there tend to be thousands or millions of them packed into small spaces, whereas seals are quite large. Um, so I'm imagining that on the left, this yeast is a population like in a tiny drop of yeast culture. And on the right, these seals are like an entire beach range. So for the yeast, when we're looking at the carrying capacity, we look where this um, curve plateaus and it's at about 13 individuals. For the seals, we look at where the curve plateaus and starts to drop and it's at about 7,500 individuals. So on a quiz, if you were looking at a plot that did not have a dotted line, you wouldn't be you would need to be able to kind of look at the curve of the general population um, and figure out what that carrying capacity is. 
So when we're thinking about human population growth, um, humans have really bounded uh, in terms of population size um, quite significantly since the 1700s, um, at which time we were way under 5 billion, kind of under 1 billion. Um, and when I put together these slides, so at about 4.40 p.m. on Wednesday, November 13th, the world population was 7.7 .7 billion. Um, in the time that I had this uh, window up, like when I was looking at this uh, clock population size counter um, online, it went up by several hundred individuals. So at that time on that day, um, there had been 266,736 births, but about uh, kind of half that amount of deaths. So remember that when we're considering population size increases, we're thinking about the number of individuals that are dying, as well as the number of individuals that are being born. So we're looking at death rates and birth rates and how those kind of balance one another out. But if we think about population size increase and we kind of have different estimates of growth um, by about 21, the year 2100, uh, if we maintain a very low population growth and even a population decline, uh, we might stay at around 7 billion. Um, but more likely, uh, barring any catastrophes happening to our planet, um, we're going to be somewhere between 10 billion and 25 billion. And it's probably realistic that we're going to hit some carrying capacity that we're not aware of yet. We already see this in a lot of the world. A lot of crises are uh, happening right now. For example, in Yemen, there's um, you know a lot of population migration, movement of people is in response to environmental carrying capacities and resource limitations. So we're seeing that kind of at a regional scale. We're not quite seeing it at a global scale yet, but it's something that we do have to be aware of. Um, another way that we can study human population growth is the time between billions. Um, so it took a very long time, our entire history, to get up to 1 billion individuals. But after that point, to get to 2 billion, it only took 130 years. Then to get to 3 billion, it only took 30 years. After that point, it's been about 10 to 15 years between billions. So I mentioned those age structures earlier. Um, when we're studying them, we can classify them using specific terms. Um, so when we have rapid growth, like the India age structure I showed you, uh, that's this kind of triangular shape where there's much more individuals on the bottom, so those lower age ranges. Slow growth is when there's kind of an equal amount of individuals um, between those upper age ranges, so like the postmenopausal uh, age ranges versus the younger age ranges. Um, and then with no growth, that's when the uh, age structure slants inward. So there's less and less people being born. We saw that in Japan as well. So when we're thinking about kind of control of human reproduction, we see uh, really serious economic and emotional effects. Um, so this uh, plot on the left is showing age structure after the uh, one child policy in China. Um, whenever we control human reproduction, uh, we have a lot of kind of serious impacts. Um, so for the one child policy, uh, kind of the thing that started to emerge was that there was not enough um, people being born to kind of help support the economy and to take care of aging parents. Um, we also see a lot of people being given up for adoption and maybe different kind of sex ratios accordingly. Um, and then with uh, Romania, you might not have heard of these policies, um, but Back in the day, there uh, was a leader who decided that uh, what Romania really needed was a lot of people in order to support the economy and work. And so uh, birth control and abortion were banned. Um, people were fined if they didn't have children. They were taxed really heavily. Um, and there were a lot of economic incentives to have children. And so people ended up having tons and tons of babies, but then couldn't support them. Um, and so they got put into these orphanages where um, 
if you uh, have any um, kind of associations with trauma, you might not want to listen to this, but a lot of these children were really horribly abused. A lot of people with learning disabilities were also put into these care facilities and abused. Um, and so uh, a lot of what we kind of think about um, about sleep training and leaving babies by themselves was kind of uh, shaped around the way that babies in these facilities were treated um, because they were kind of just put into cribs and left alone and not soothed at all um, and so people would go in after a while and these babies had basically trained themselves not to cry because they wouldn't receive any support. Um, and so this whole generation of people were traumatized severely uh, based on some of these policies to control human reproduction. Um, so kind of moving away from that and thinking about human interaction with other species, we see this a lot as we encroach on different animals' habitats. Um, so we, in, when I lived in the Bay Area, when I taught at San Francisco State, uh, it was pretty common to be driving through the East Bay and to see deer crossing the street. I saw them in my backyard sometimes. There were raccoons and possums all over the place um, and foxes as well. But there were also tons of coyotes and people would always post on the app next door saying like, oh, my cat was eaten today, which is just horrific. But also, I mean, we're living in an area that has actual like mountain lions walking around too um, so it's kind of a, a trade-off that we have this encroachment of their territory and having to deal with interspecific competition so it was pretty normal to see coyotes running around too in heavily populated areas um, there are signs all over parks that you go to in the bay area saying that coyotes are in the area so don't leave your dogs and cats unattended but interspecific competition is very common when different organisms or species share an environment and compete for the same resources, so occupying the same niches. Um, and so like I mentioned in the Bay Area, coyote populations have stabilized over time, but we see more and more attacks on pets because we're sharing a lot of space with them. So when we're thinking about interactions between organisms, uh, one way that we can characterize them in terms of eating is predation and herbivory. So um, when we're thinking about kind of predator and prey dynamics, they're actually quite dependent on one another and predator action is super important. Um, if you don't have a predator eating prey and controlling populations, then prey species are likely to kind of decimate a uh, location, they eat a lot of plants, a lot of vegetation, um, and then they don't have enough to kind of sustain the ecosystem. So predators are very important to maintain those populations. Um, that's why as uh, kind of ranchers brought in different animals and livestock to certain areas, especially throughout the Midwest, so thinking about populations of wolves, um, it was very uh, kind of bad for the environment because a lot of the uh, predator species were killed and hunted, um, and then that kind of led to problems for existing prey species. Um, so in some locations, hunters play very important roles because we've killed a lot of those predators and they're not there to manage those species. So it is really important for hunters to perform that ecosystem service. Um, also, remember that when we're thinking about herbivory, plants are living things, um, and so eating them is kind of also eating living things. Um, so when we're thinking about relationships between organisms, herbivory is a relationship between organisms that eat those plants and the plants themselves. Um, and plants and animals have defense mechanisms against both herbivory and predation. So plants have a lot of cool secondary metabolites they produce, a lot of things like thorns as well. And so that prevents animals from eating them. Um, so we think about stuff like thorns, we think about different poisons, we think about stuff like turtle shells and coiling up when you're an insect to protect against something eating you. A few other symbioses. Um, when we think about symbioses, these tend to be a little bit longer lived than predation and herbivory, which end in death. Um, one positive symbiosis is mutualism. So this is when both individuals in the symbiosis benefit. Um, so for example, in this image on the left, this uh, 
I don't know if it's a crocodile or an alligator, uh, but it's having its teeth cleaned, which means that it's going to have parasites removed from its body. It doesn't eat the bird because there's a benefit to the bird removing those parasites and the bird gets food out of it. Commensalism is when one individual benefits and the other is not affected at all. So in this example, a bird is building its nest on a tree. The tree is not affected in any way, but the bird is benefiting from having that space. One that you might be familiar with is parasitism. That's when one individual benefits and the other suffers. Not generally enough to kill you right away, um, but there's definitely long-term health effects from parasitism. So this example is with malaria, which um, infects your bloodstream. Um, malaria is caused by a parasite, by a, um, a protozoan called um, called plasmodium, um, and it is spread through mosquitoes. So it causes really serious problems in a lot of the world. Um, it affects your liver, your bloodstream, a lot of different things, and it can be extremely dangerous. So one other thing I wanted to talk about um, in thinking kind of about this relationship between resource limitation, energy trade-offs, different species interactions and evolution is this idea of the competitive exclusion principle. So because resources are limited, two species uh, that are very similar can't occupy the same niche within a habitat. So if we look at this example of paramecium, paramecium is a protist. Um, it's this cute little guy swimming around in the skiff at the top right. Um, and there's different types of paramecium. There's paramecium aurelia, which is plotted with the green plot, and paramecium caudatum, which is plotted with the purple plot. And when these organisms are cultured on their own, they show similar growth patterns and they grow quite well. But when they're put together, Paramecium aurelia outcompetes Paramecium caudatum um, and it survives while Paramecium caudatum dies. So this is following that competitive exclusion principle. They are too similar to occupy the same space, so one of them is going to die. So one uh, ad adaptation to that is adaptive radiation. Um, we, so we saw that with evolution of uh, the Galapagos finches or Darwin's finches. Um, these organisms are all very similar, but because they have these differently shaped beaks, they're able to occupy um, similar areas because they don't occupy the same niche anymore, they eat different foods. So it's divergent evolution that results in the occupation of different niches. Okay, so remember that this lecture, as well as the other lecture for the same final week, um, are going to be tested on uh, with evolution on the final quiz. So it's a longer quiz um, that should be completed between Tuesday the 19th and Tuesday the 26th. Um, I would encourage you to get it done before the review session on the 26th so that we can go over the answers. Um, but you have lots of time to get it done. It's a 50 minute quiz, so you should have plenty of time to work through it.